or even the work of justice alone. He wanted us all to have what he called radical amazement. But maybe some of you felt as you were experiencing that anthem up here. He wanted us to confront not only the ills, society's ills, but the ineffable. He wanted us to encounter not just a reality that needed to be fixed, but a mystery within and beyond things and ideas, a mystery that needed to be felt. The divine is within, he said, because the self is something transcendent in disguise. The divine is beyond, he said, because it also is a message that discloses unity where we see diversity, that discloses peace when we are involved in discord. God meant for Heschel that no one is ever alone. No one. This is a universalistic message. And you may hear some of Buddhism and Hinduism in this too, more on Hinduism in a bit. Heschel, this social justice warrior, this biblical scholar, felt intuitively, felt intuitively and religiously that no one is ever alone, that we are all connected by a holiness that is both within and beyond our being. This is a mystical sense of divinity that I can get down that is a God, his God is a God, a connective experience of the holy that I can believe in, even when I don't see it. A God that I can believe in, even when in this climate, toxic with fear of the other, broken by hatred of our neighbors, lost in wars upon wars, a God that to my ears at times is silent, Heschel was a justice warrior with a mythical spirituality, and he trusted his intuitions of the holy. And I dig on the mystical and this intuitive wisdom. The story of Svetiketu from our time for all ages comes from the ancient Hindu texts, the Upanishads, texts that explore an intuitive mythical spirituality. You can find Svetiketu in both the Chandyoga and the Brihadaranyaka Upanishads. Those are the earliest texts, collections of stories that might date back as far as the 6th century before the Common Era. That's some old wisdom. The name Upanishad comes from the terms Upa, near, and Shad, to sit, meaning something like sitting down near. Brings to mind the duck, doesn't it? Like sitting at the feet of an illumined teacher, as aspirants still do in India today. The Upanishadic age was a pluralistic time, a time when diverse ideas were meeting at the crossroads where near, newly conjoined peoples were sharing their sacred truth. The Upanishads are respected not because, not because they are considered revealed or shruti, not because they contain literal truth, sacred information, but because they present spiritual ideas that are inspiring, that offer radical amazement. To inspire, what does that mean? It means to fill with spirit, to inspire. Not fill with facts, not fill with information, but fill with spirit. The Upanishads present spiritual, present spiritual inspirations like ahimsa, nonviolence, satya, truthfulness, daya, compassion, and karma, ethical consequences. And you will find the little duck there too, not exactly but in this brilliant idea called Atman is Brahman. I'm going to ask you to sit down near this next spiritual inspiration, Atman is Brahman, because it's one that consoles me, that serves me, and I hope it will serve you too. 
You may want to get comfortable in your seats, rest your eyes even, allow your critical mind to take a breather. If just for a few moments, breathe. Let me tell you about how Atman, Atman is Brahman. Atman is soul, individual soul, the essence of each individual thing, your primary individual living energy. Atman is yours. It is the immortal and eternal part of yourself, your energy, energy that has been passed down to you from the dawn of being, that you carry in your person. That is Atman. That is you. Now Brahman. Brahman is world soul or cosmic soul. It is the eternal essence of the universe and reality. It is the life force of all that is and will be. Try and sense that. Try and feel the connection between you and the chair, and the floor, even the walls, maybe the sun, the warmth, the breath that moves in and through you. That is Brahman. That is the eternal essence of all that is. Atman is Brahman. What is you and yours is what is eternal and all. Your individual soul is the world soul. There's no distinction, no barrier, no wall. There's a flow from one to the other. The energy is shared. We are one. No one is left alone. Breathe. Welcome to open your eyes if you've closed them. I didn't just give you that as information. And I don't have any proof. <laughs> but this is inspiration. It's inspiration that has withstood since the 6th century, before the common era. And I like to sit down near it and breathe. It warms me like the sun, even when the sun is not shining. The German philosopher Schopenhauer said of the Upanishads, it has been my solace in life, it will be the solace of my death. If there is a key note and overriding sentiment in the Upanishads, it is simply know thyself, but not in a cursory way. Deeper than ego, deeper than the separation that is skin, know thyself like the little duck. In an intrinsic, instinctual way, know that you are part of it all. This is not informational knowing, this is intuitional wisdom. And it's often the solace of my life, and I believe it will be the solace of my death as well. I was in a yoga class not too long ago. I go to yoga classes a lot in my life. I was in a yoga class and there was a mirror in front of me and I was feeling particularly peaceful that day and at ease. And I was meditating, staring into the mirror. And I had this amazing experience. I watched in the mirror and I hadn't it's just breathing. <laughs> I watched in the mirror as the separation of myself suddenly got dissolved and mingled with all that was in the room. And I felt in that moment that who I was was merging with all that is. And I felt an incredible and awesome peace. And I knew in that moment that I was not afraid to die. 
Because that's what death would be. That merger. I like to sit down in that. Sit near that. And let it hold me. Is there a part of you that's screaming nonsense? Good. I see people shaking their head no, but if so, it's okay to admit it. Nonsense, gibberish, blarney. Some of the best words out there are synonyms for nonsense, you know? <laughs> and they're fun to say. And it makes sense if even just a tiny part of you is thinking them. I have that voice too. The one that reveres all things rational. That likes order and organization. <laughs> Relying on intuition, never mind spiritual intuition, has a bad reputation, especially in the Western world. Dominant culture over the past many decades has promoted analytic thinking and rational conclusions, and the myth that we can know all things with certainty. Gradually, we've come to think of progress as the progression from primitive, magical, and religious thinking to analytical and scientific inquiry. Gradually, we've come to think of intuition as a whimsical and fallible tool, and inspiration as just fiddle foul. Another one of those good words. I'm not even going to get into how sexist this is. <laughs> Because it's thought of that women are the ones with intuition, right? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you another story. So I used to be a runner. Are you still hearing me? I used to be a runner. And about 10 years ago, I went out running, and it was one of the coldest days of the year. For, so I reached for a hat, even though I normally didn't reach for a hat when I went running. And I put the hat on my head, and I went out on the trails out beyond our house in Sterling, Virginia. And I was running for a while before I saw someone else, but the first person I saw looked at me in the strangest way and made me feel so uncomfortable. Why are they paying attention to me? We're just two runners passing in the woods. Why are they staring at me? And it made me really nervous. And I kept running, and then there was another person that was doing the same. And then even a third. And I was beginning to feel scared and uncomfortable. And what is wrong with all of these people? Why are they staring at me in that way? Is there some, I began to think that maybe there was this group of people that were out hunting other people in the woods. <laughs> I had concocted all of these incredible ideas about what was going on, how they were part of a club. And how they were all going to be chasing me the entire rest of the way home. I was looking behind myself more than I was looking forward. I almost tripped 20 times in the woods. I was staring in every direction. And then I got home and felt safe and closed the door and took the hat off of my head. <laughs> <laughs>
may it be so.